meeting tonight. Town meeting tonight. Are the schools doing their job? Town meeting tonight. Town meeting tonight. is on the air. Tonight, we greet you from the Cleveland Public Auditorium, Cleveland, Ohio, where America's town meeting is being conducted as one of the features of the 69th Annual Convention of the American Association of School Administrators. Welcome to an open, unrehearsed, and spontaneous discussion, which, as usual, will be conducted by our moderator, Mr. George V. Denny, Jr., President of Town Hall, New York, and founder of America's town meeting of the air. Mr. Denny. Good evening, neighbors, and special greetings to our fellow American educators, upon whom so great a part of the burden of preserving our American democracy rests. This is the first broadcast of America's Town Meeting of the Air outside of Town Hall, New York, during our regular session, and we could just scarcely have chosen a more appropriate setting. Moreover, word has come to us through our Town Hall Advisory Service America's town meeting is being used increasingly by teachers in connection with their regular classes. What better introduction, after all, to the complex social and political problems of our day than to hear two or more authorities voice their opinions on these highly controversial topics? Without telling young minds what to think, the town meeting method endeavors to show them how to think by presenting different points of view on vital public questions, a task which is extremely difficult for the individual teacher. This is a task we are undertaking here tonight as we ask ourselves this important question. Are the schools doing their job? Now, what is that job? Someone has said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton and Harrow. Well, if our peacetime battle for successful democracy is to be won in this country, the field on which the result is determined may well be our American public school system. What the American people are concerned about, therefore, is whether that system is doing its job of educating citizens for life in a modern democracy, and what, if anything, should be done to help it do that job better. Chancellor Harry W. Chase of New York University, <coughs> one of Town Hall's trustees and chairman of our radio advisory committee, has defined education as the process of developing a personality that is at home in the modern world. If we accept this definition, the problems of the educator are greater today than at any period before in our history. <coughs> We're extremely fortunate in having with us this evening a panel of speakers and an audience, perhaps better qualified than any other in America, to consider this topic. Here is my good friend, the United States Commissioner of Education, Dr. John W. Studebaker, known throughout the country as the founder of the Des Moines Public Forums, which he inaugurated, inaugurated while he was superintendent of schools in that city and later for the Federal Forum Projects established by the Office of Education under his direction. I think he's one of the most active commissioners of education this country has ever had. Another is Dr. Luther H. Gulick of Columbia University and director of the New York Regents' Inquiry into the character and cost of public education to that state. Dr. Mortimer J. Adler of the University of Chicago, also our guest this evening, <coughs> is the man who, together with President Hutchins, has been insisting that liberal arts 
is the basis for a sound education. Some weeks ago, we conducted an essay contest on this program, the subject being, what is America's greatest need today? And out of nearly 3,000 essays submitted, one in particular claimed our attention for its startling statements of educational deficiencies in this country at the present time. This essay received first honorable mention in the contest, and its author is here with us tonight. He is Dr. J. A. Starak, Associate Professor of Vocational Education in Ohio State College, Ohio State College. And we've asked him to be our first speaker. I therefore take great pleasure in presenting at this time, Dr. Starrett. Mr. Moderator, fellow speakers on the platform, ladies and gentlemen. In these United States today, millions of our children are receiving their education at the hands of ignorant, untrained, underpaid, and underprivileged teachers in wretched shacks, uncomfortable, ugly, and devoid of libraries, pictures, maps, and all other sources of beauty and culture, while other millions are being taught by comparatively well-trained teachers in buildings which are beautiful, comfortable, and sanitary. We spend five dollars per year on the education of a child in one section and $500 in another, an average of $23 in one state and $130 in another. The school year varies from three to nine months in length, and the minimum teacher qualifications from eight years of elementary school to graduation from college. In the schools of tomorrow, these glaring inequalities must be corrected since the very essence of democracy for children must be found in the inequality of educational opportunity. The curriculum of the typical school of today deals too much with the past and too little with the present and the probable future. Moreover, it is stereotyped, inflexible, and dehumanized. The school of tomorrow must deal with the current and future needs and problems of society and must make provision for the needs, capacities, and interests of the individual. It will not disregard the past and the present social values, but rather will interpret in the light of current conditions and needs the many important lessons of present-day value which can be gained from the past. Instead of obscuring them, as it now does, with a mass of insignificant detail. This implies the free discussion of controversial issues in the classroom and the critical evaluation of our existing institutions. All forms of restriction on academic freedom will, of course, be conspicuous by their absence. Today in our schools, too much emphasis is placed upon memorization by rote and too little upon purposeful thinking. The new school must reverse this emphasis. Problematic situations demanding the use of reasoning, judgment, and creative thought must be employed. These problems must be designed to involve the discovery of those ideals, principles, and techniques which are essential to intelligent participation in a democracy, as well as their repeated application to the practical situations of present-day life. In other words, they must be real problems of real people in a real world. In the solution of these problems, the student must be habituated to the observance of the standards of straight thinking. It is admitted that the typical teacher in our public schools is incapable of teaching by the method described. But this does not invalidate the method. Our teachers today are, as a rule, inadequately educated miserably paid, and are accorded a relatively low social position. These conditions repel our most capable and ambitious young people. In no other important modern nation are the professional and social standards of teachers as low as in these United States, and they must be raised. The conditions of the new school which affect teacher welfare must be made so attractive as to induce a sufficient number of our best young people to undertake extended training for the profession. 
This means not only much greater economic reward and higher professional qualifications, but also greater and more general public recognition of the importance of the profession. The administration of our schools today is far from being democratic, while in a few isolated cases, some semblance of teacher and student participation in the administration of schools exists. In the typical situation, the superintendent is vested with autocratic powers, and the teachers and students have little or no voice in determining policies, curriculum, regulations, and conditions of work. The new school must abandon these inconsistent practices and must educate for democratic participation in the affairs of life by giving both teachers and students experience in determining and in applying the rules under which they are to live, work, and play. All other methods of teaching democracy will be effective only when they supplement such actual participation. Otherwise, they can produce only the apathy and cynicism towards democratic processes and institutions which are all too prevalent in America today. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Well, it seems from this statement that our school system at this time is far from perfect. We thank you for your challenging comments. And now I take pleasure in presenting the United States Commissioner of Education, Dr. John W. Studebaker. Dr. Studebaker. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and friends, I feel proud tonight that I represent the great profession of teaching and of public school administration. I say this knowing very well that there are many weaknesses in the operation of our American schools. It is certainly no novelty for educators to point out these weaknesses or to have them described. I challenge all other organizations to exemplify more completely than have the school executives assembled in Cleveland this week the spirit of sincere, honest self-criticism. The subject we were really asked to discuss was phrased as follows. How can our public schools better educate for democratic citizenship? I choose, therefore, to discuss that aspect of the job of education which is concerned rather directly with preparation of people for citizenship in a democracy. At the outset, let me say that this problem of making public education safeguard and strengthen democratic society is not merely the responsibility of educators. It is one which calls for the thought and positive action of citizens generally, whose present public opinion gives direction to our agencies of public education. What that public opinion is makes a great difference in what the schools do, because public schools, in their purposes and procedures, cannot deviate very much from the prevailing public opinion concerning the job which the schools should do. If public opinion is afraid to allow young people to develop alert minds by grappling with controversial issues, the schools will no doubt dodge the consideration of such issues. If the public generally wants its children drilled in a sort of goose step to accept uncritically what they are told to believe or what they read, that's about what most schools will do. It seems to me that educators and laymen are recognizing increasingly that the school society itself must be a workshop in democratic living. They are aware that we cannot get good citizenship cheaply and directly merely by inserting in the curriculum a few courses on this subject. They see that the responsibility for teaching the social studies must not be delegated to the general teacher with little or no specialized training in the social studies. In these days of world crises and serious domestic social problems, the social sciences should be under the sponsorship of only superior teachers. Our educational and civic leaders are more than ever convinced that we cannot get enough superior teachers at, uh, let us say, $900 per year each. When we pay a teacher $900 a year, we should remember that we are buying only $900 worth of teaching. We may sometimes get more teaching than we pay for, but as in all other fields, we usually get no more than our money's worth. May I now present briefly three points to express my own conception of how public education can better do its job in educating for citizenship in our democracy. First, we must give youth real experiences in grappling with controversial issues and with significant modern problems. 
And we must do this during several years before the pupils leave the secondary schools. A citizen in a democratic society must know how to think and talk about issues concerning which there is an honest or even a dishonest difference of opinion. Young people must learn how to do this in the schools. This ability possessed in common by the people is essential to the democratic way of life. Therefore, the development of this ability is a primary obligation of public schools. But it is not the mission of the teaching profession to force either young people or older people to accept so-called right thoughts or to come to right conclusions about controversial issues. That is the declared aim of education in a dictatorship. It is also the purpose of men with dictatorial temperaments who today lead certain groups in this country. But as devotees of democracy, as believers in a system of society which recognizes the dignity and value of human personality, our aim must be to make men free by teaching them to think critically and to draw upon the experiences and the understandings of one another. Second, the job of education for citizenship requires that youth should come into possession of knowledge of accepted value. I agree with those who want students to come out of high school with some definite knowledge in their intellectual repositories. For one thing, graduates ought to have a real sense of historic time and a clear understanding of the struggle of man, mankind down through the ages, particularly of the struggle of our forebears who gave us our priceless traditions of democracy. Pupils ought to know many solid facts about the world in which they live. But we can't stop there. They must know how to spot a fact and how to unmask a prejudice posing as a fact. They should be able to read rapidly, write lucidly, to speak accurately, and to use the principles of logic. Good citizenship calls for competency in the use of the tools of expression. Third, our schools must give both young people and older people a positive experience in free exploration. Democracy is a way of life that prepares people to meet the unexpected and the unforeseen. No one can prophesy what free men in possession of their highest human powers may achieve. Dictatorship tries to fence in the future and to hold it to a preconceived course. But education for a democratic society must avoid boxing in the minds of youth to the molds of the present. Democratic education is concerned with liberating the minds of youth for an unpredictable future. Our youth must grow up in an atmosphere of freedom. They must know that a democratic society wants men and women with explorative minds capable of breaking through old forms and outworn dogmas. Let educators beware of those actions and regulations which seek to curb the zest of youth for chasing its curiosities or which are apt to make them cynical and subservient yes-men. Good education is like good exploration. We simply cannot decide in advance exactly what we shall find, nor can we close our minds to it if it doesn't please us to believe that what we find exists. We prepare for exploration by learning the best known ways of exploring, and we prepare for exploring by actually trying out the methods under good guides. That is the major task of public education. Create a nation of prepared explorers, ready to discover what really lies out there on the social frontiers of, mod of the modern world. Let no one assume the role of dogmatist and tell the learners what they must find when they go. If they are well prepared, they are almost sure to find something which we today have not yet seen or understood. Can we not have faith that if this generation actually learns to think critically, cooperatively, patiently, to study, to discuss, to struggle with the facts and to grapple with the implications of experience, 
that they will do the unexpected, that they will find a better way of life than we have found in our time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Studebaker. And now I take pleasure in welcoming to town, to, uh, a town meeting platform a former colleague and old friend, Dr. Mortimer Adler of the University of Chicago. Dr. Adler. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is a quarter of a century now since John Dewey wrote his famous book on democracy and education. That essential problem has not changed. But we have changed in our attitude toward the problem. Frightened by the menace of tyranny in all its totalitarian forms, our people, or at least their education leaders, have become almost hysterical about making education save democracy in America. In educational circles, almost nothing else is discussed. Certainly not the problem of what constitutes a good education entirely apart from democracy and its present crisis. Some of us are now sufficiently removed from the hysteria of making the world safe for democracy by war to be able to question such means. Perhaps we can also get detached enough to ask whether we must not save education itself from being used as a kind of counter-propaganda if we are to preserve the liberal institutions of American life. I should like to propose the thesis that democracy is a good society insofar as all its institutions respect the integrity, the sanctity of human beings, and help them achieve good lives. We have relearned this truth from the contrast presented by the bad societies in the world today, which make the state an absolute end, using men as mere means, sacrificing human life to false gods. Such bad societies, vicious in principle, as well as ruthless in execution, cannot afford to consider education as a means for perfecting men and making them happy. On the contrary, they must use education as they use other pressures and propaganda, secret police and concentration camps to make men into political puppets. They misuse education because they misuse men. The basic principle of American democracy that men have sacred rights above the state forbid such misuse. Public education serves democracy only through serving the welfare of its citizens, not merely as subjects of the state, but as free men. In fact, unless education makes men free, it cannot serve democracy at all. The question, what is a good education, can be answered in two ways. Either in turn, of what is good for men at any time and place because they are men, or in terms of what is good for men considered only as members of a particular social and political order. My thesis is that the best society is the one in which the two answers are the same. To honor our American institutions, we must believe that the problem of education in our democracy is solved only by determining what is good education for all men everywhere? I think the answer to the question, what is a good education, has long been known and can be briefly summarized. The aim of education is not to create puppets for the state, but to develop to the full all the powers which men have. The natures men are born with are developed by the habits they form, and education must seek to make those habits good rather than bad. The basic point here is that men are rational, and that they are free only through the most disciplined exercise of reason. Unless they have good moral habits, they are slaves to their passions and dangerous to their fellows. Unless they have good intellectual habits, reason cannot function well. This is to say no more than that education must cultivate critical intelligence above all things. It must make men able to think straight about every problem and to be able to act accordingly. A great educator has said, the discipline that is identical with trained power is also identical with freedom. Genuine freedom, in short, is intellectual. It rests in the trained power of thought. That educator was John Dewey. Not only is democracy good as a society 
because it can afford to give men the education best suited to their human nature, but further, the best education is one which supports democracy itself and threatens any other kind of government. Democratic government is the political order in which popular sovereignty is most fully realized by the widest participation of all its citizens in ruling as well as being ruled. This is impossible unless men have been disciplined to use reason unless their minds are free. When men can be pushed about by propaganda, they are as servile as when they are cowed by brute force. When men are un unable to exercise free judgment, they cannot be leaders in public life, nor can they even be followers in the democratic sense of independent subjects. Democracy must have both leaders and followers. It cannot endure unless men of both sorts play their different roles freely through trained intelligence. Otherwise, the leaders become demagogues and the people a mob they move. The same education which perfects man's rationality is indispensable to democratic life and inimical to all forms of tyranny and slavery. The end being clear, what are the means? What is the curriculum which is at once ideal in itself and also the best for democratic citizenship? At this point, I most sharply disagree with the existing program of edu education in America, a curriculum in which current events and social studies dominate, in which extracurricular activities such as hobbies and games are given undue importance, in which individual differences are catered to by a chaotic elective system neither educates nor liberates. Knowledge of current events and indulgence in self-expression cannot make us free. Only a liberal education liberates, and the essentials of a liberal education are the three R's, by which I mean those basic skills, the mastery of which should be signified by the liberal arts degree. Human beings learn to think critically and clearly by learning to read and listen critically, to write and speak clearly. Because other things of much less importance have been given first place, almost the whole place in contemporary education, our students simply cannot read, write, or speak well, even after college. And it goes without saying that they cannot think well. Unless we insist on education which really educates, we cannot produce a generation able to meet the arduous demand of democratic citizenship. The founding fathers of this republic were liberally educated as no school child today is. The men who wrote and ratified the Constitution knew how to read and write. While we have properly undertaken to make public education more widespread than it was in the 18th century, education need not become less liberal as it becomes more universal. At every level, and for all elements in the population, the same kind of education which enable democracy to take root in this country must be regained if its flowering is to be protected today from the winds of violence abroad in the world. Thank you, Dr. Adler. Now we pause one moment for station identification. Three years ago, the Board of Regents of the State of New York appointed a special committee to study the defects of our present-day school system and possible remedies for them. The study was made under the direction of our next speaker, Professor Luther H. Gulick of Columbia University, and he's therefore well qualified to speak on this subject. I take great pleasure in presenting to you at this time Dr. Gulick. Mr. Chairman and friends, our topic this evening, are the schools doing their job, calls for an answer which depends entirely on what you expect of the schools. Not being a professional educationist, like the Commissioner of Education, Commissioner Studebaker, or a philosopher like Professor Adler, it is much easier for me than it is for them to tell in simple words what I expect the schools to do. In fact, I got my definition from a little curly-headed boy of six last summer. While I was waiting for a traffic light to change, I saw a youngster in overalls and nothing much else down on the sidewalk playing with some bright painted lead automobiles 
in the shade of a public school, which at the time was locked up tight, playground and all. A good old American custom. <laughs> we talked a while about his cars. And then he stood up very straight and looked into my face and said, Mr. When next week goes into next week, I'm going to school. In answer to my further question, he said, School helps me grow up. And that is just what I expect of the schools. Here we have all around us boys and girls growing up to take our place in the world just as we have taken the place of those who are now gone. Education is the process of getting ready to take over civilization and to carry it forward. And the schools are the chief institutions we have organized to help boys and girls grow up so that they can take over intelligently, efficiently, happily. There never was a time when thoughtful men have not paused to draw up a catalog of things growing youth need. We started that way here this evening. We are very busy with it here in America just now. You will find two fine statements that have just come out, one in the purpose of education by the Educational Policies Commission and one in the reports of the New York Regents Inquiry. At different times in history, those who draw up the lists emphasize different things. You will remember how much emphasis Lord Chesterfield put on travel and manners. In America today, we are emphasizing education for work because it is so hard to get work, and education for democratic citizenship because our democratic ideals have been specifically challenged as they have not been for over 150 years. In this business of growing up to take over civilization and carry it forward, there are at least six kinds of growth that youngsters need. And in these six points, I've summarized what we were discussing earlier this evening. In this, the first is, first, they need the basic tools of communication and brain work. These are talking, reading, writing, numbers, and vocabulary. This is where all education begins and why we talk about the three R's as the foundation of schoolwork. But the three R's are not like the foundation of a building which is finished before the building goes up. With the three R's, we lay the foundation, start to erect the building, and then go back continuously to improve and extend the foundation in a never-ending process. In fact, school merely starts off that process, and the individual then carries it on by himself all through life. One of the main jobs of the school is to get up steam in the individual so that he will go on growing under his own steam after he leaves school. Do you remember the old style motorcycle that you had to get a friend to run along beside until you got it going? Well, education is something like that. The teacher runs along beside, selecting the road, pushing, steering until the engine gets going and generates its own power. The second need of growing youth, which education must try to give, is knowledge. That is, related information about the world and about himself, about science, history, human affairs, and ideas. Knowledge doesn't float around loose in the mind like seaweed in the ocean. It has to be attached to something firm. It is more like coral and grows piece by piece and branch by branch on top of what is there before. The job of the schools is to try to start out something on each one of the main branches of human knowledge so that each boy or girl will have a well-balanced tree with branches in every direction along which he can grow in future years even if he should decide to specialize along one of them. The third need of growing youth is social experience. When they grow up, these boys and girls, they are going to be the rulers of America through their ballots and their influence. High school is not too early for them to start learning by experience how to work with others, to meet problems and to get things done. You have to learn how to work on a committee. You have to learn how to select a representative or to be a representative and how to see other people's problems 
needs, and desires. Organization is not an instinct, it is a skill, and one that is acquired by practice. This business of decision, based not on force, but on discussion and compromise, is so fundamental for American democracy as a way of life that the development of social competence in the rising generation and a working acquaintance with the community about them strikes me as a fundamental job of the public school. A fourth need of growing youth is the chance to blossom out through some creative artistic experience. This means something different for different youngsters and differs at various times in their growth, but it is essential for their balanced development and for happy adult life. A fifth need of growing youth is for sound ideals and standards. The habit of thinking and acting in accordance with ideals and standards is what we call character. Some people think the schools should have nothing to do with trying to train a boy's character. The trouble with that theory is that the schools can't help it. Character is building every hour of the day in connection with every classroom contact, every playground activity, every subject studied. It is not belittling the job of the home, the community, out-of-school activities, or the church to say that the school has a major task to perform in building sound ethical character and seeing that boys in a gir and girls in America understand and passionately believe in democracy as a way of life. There is a sixth need for a growing youth, the need for a marketable skill or something on the basis of which he can get a job fairly promptly after leaving school. And it may well be doubted if he should be permitted to leave school until he has a job in sight. It is a mistake to put too much emphasis on narrow vocational education, or to think that you can tell when a boy is 15 or 16 just what a youth is fitted to do. But under modern conditions, the school must take its responsibility in connection with placing the boy or the girl. While I have listed these six jobs for the American public school, the mastery of tools of communication and brain work, the acquisition of knowledge, democratic social experience, the stimulation of creative growth, and the formulation of ideals and standards, and the development of a marketable work skill, we must remember that they are just parts of a single job, and that the good teacher is doing all of these things at the same time regardless of the title of the course. In this whole process of education, there is nothing half so important as the teacher. With the same book to read, one teacher can teach facts, and the other how to read and think. One can cram the memory with meaningless dates. The other can not only make the past live, but can relate it to the present and build a bridge to the future. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Now we're ready for the questions here in Cleveland and a little later from New York. If you have a question, please rise. State the name of the person to whom your question is directed. That man have a question there. I'd like to ask, sir, that Dr. Adler define more carefully and more clearly what he means by a liberal education. What goes to make a liberal education? Dr. Adler, will you define a little more clearly what you mean by a liberal education? By liberal education, I mean, first of all, the mastery of the basic intellectual skills, reading, writing, speaking, and a forced thinking. I mean, secondly, a command of the basic ideas of European culture, not a divorce from the past, but a use of the past as a tradition which provides us with a cultural heritage. And these two things cannot be accomplished in one course or two courses. They require the whole curriculum to do for many years. The reason why there's some difference among us here this evening, I think, is not that we don't all emphasize reading, writing, and speaking, but I may differ from my colleagues here by thinking that it takes almost four to eight years of school life to teach boys and girls how to do these simple, basic things. Thank you. Dr. Studebaker, how about your commenting on what Dr. Adler has just said? Do you agree with him? Let's see how we can get you two together on this, if... If we can. Certainly, I think we all agree uh, with the desirability of that kind of education. Uh, how we're going to get it is the problem. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Adler would not uh, contend 
that we can dispense that sort of liberal education to boys and girls who drop out of school at the age of 16 or 17. Now, we face those practical questions. There are 76 million adults in this country today, 64 million of whom did not finish the high school, and 32 million of whom did not finish the eighth grade of the common school. Now, practical school people must crowd into those few years all of the kinds of education that seem to be most appropriate at the time. And they cannot do the thing that theoretically would be most ideal. Thank you, sir. Next question. Dr. Adler thinks that the three uh, R's are sufficient to help boys and girls learn to make a living. Are the three R's sufficient to make boys and girls earn a living? Yes. But the end of education is not to help boys and girls earn a living. Thank you. Dr. Stewartbeck. Dr. Stewartbeck. Yes. At what point does academic freedom become academic sabotage? At what point does academic freedom become academic sabotage? That's interesting. <laughs> well, I'm fond of saying that I think uh, academic freedom should mean freedom to the learners to learn and not freedom to the teachers to preach. Uh, it seems to me when any teacher undertakes to preach his personal gospel and impose it upon the learners, academic freedom for the learners has vanished. And it was really invented for the benefit of the learners rather than for the teachers. Dr. Studebaker again. We are told across the water that the weakness of our democracy is the confusion of our leadership. What is being done in our schools to develop leadership? What is being done in our schools to develop leadership? I wish I had on my desk here before me all of the innumerable uh, illustrations I could cite of that. I think they're pretty well known. All of these plans, even in the elementary schools, for student government, uh, student participation in the management of the school, uh, student clubs inquiring into community affairs, uh, sports, uh, all sorts of devices. I think they're spreading uh, now, and they will become more popular as years go on. More and more, it seems to me, our educational system is causing learners to uh, accept the responsibility uh, for leadership in decisions concerning community and national affairs. Uh, what about science in our system of education? What about science in your liberal arts education? Uh, the liberal arts include the arts of reading, writing, and speaking, the arts of reckoning, the mathematical arts, and with the mathematical arts, the arts of measurement and scientific exploration. They will be involved in the, in the basic discipline that any rational mind must use. But in addition to that, since a liberal education consists also in acquaintance with the basic, the leading ideas and generalizations of our European tradition, a liberally educated boy or girl will necessarily be acquainted with the ideas and the principles of all the natural sciences. Thank you. The lady there. Uh, Dr. Studebaker. Dr. Studebaker. Uh, and both Dr. Studebaker and Dr. Bulick have stressed the importance of the superior teacher. I would like to know not if uh, the measure of a superior teacher is not the measure of the intangibles. Who is to judge the superior teacher, the superiority, and how is he to judge it? How are you going to judge a superior teacher? And who's going to do the judging? Uh, you put that question to both of us. I'm perfectly willing that my friends should start first. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kewitt. I, I see the commissioner is skillful at framing other people. He has such fine answers, though, that I'm tempted to step aside. But if I did that, then you would say that my answer was merely stealing his thunder. So I'm going to proceed to answer. How do you pick the uh, superior teacher? Well, in the first place, you start way back at the point where the teacher starts her training. We have normal schools all over this country that are taking in young men and young, young women who plan to be teachers. That's one place at which definite tests can be made. And we know from the elaborate tests that have been made by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, some of the methods of picking a good teacher through tests. Then comes the educational process itself, in which the teacher is observed by his and her own teachers. And then comes appointment. In Providence, Rhode Island, 
Before the teacher is appointed, all of the applicants are given standardized tests that get at the general cultural level, the extent to which the teacher has mastered what uh, Dr. Adler calls our European tradition. I'm a little hesitant to call it that myself. Uh, but in any case, gets at the knowledge and information of that teacher, and then after an interview, which is held by five members, including the school administration and some of the teachers, the teacher is selected. Then the teacher goes to work. There is still a further testing through the educational supervisors. And in that way, you have a machinery for selecting, for appointing, and then for watching the results and seeing what the youngsters get out of it. And in that process, you can find the superior teacher. Thank you very much, Dr. Kulik. Dr. Studebaker says he's satisfied with your answer, and I'm going to read him a telegram that's just come in from Saginaw, Michigan, sent at 9.53 p.m., signed Saginaw High School Journalism Class, Saginaw, Michigan. Dr. Studebaker, don't you believe American high school pupils are propagandized by narrowly educated instructors? <laughs> oh. I don't know just what the questioner may mean by propagandized, but assuming that... Uh, uh, the word carries with it some stigma. I should say that uh, I think we've all discovered that there are uh, some people who in uh, one sense are not narrowly educated and who are not in the educational profession who are also guilty of propagandizing people. Uh, I don't think it's a question of uh, being too narrowly educated. Again, if I may... Uh, use the connotation of propagandize, as I understand the questioner to use it. I think that's a question of um, intent or purpose. Uh, I think that uh, there are many teachers who are not broadly educated, as we say, who are nevertheless extremely uh, very sincere in their motives and purposes, and they're intellectually honest. Thank you, sir. Next question. Dr. No, the young man, but, but, uh, Dr. Gulick. Dr. According to the Regents' Inquiry, what are the schools doing best of all? What are the schools doing best of all? The schools in New York State are doing best of all the traditional education in the three R's. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Dr. Adler. Which do you consider the most important to Dr. Adler. Dr. Adler. Which do you consider the most important to a student? The three R's or the developing of a high moral character? The choice between the intellectual and the moral virtues is a hard one to make. But if I had to make the choice, I would choose the moral virtues always. Because the intellectual virtues, without the moral virtues, can be viciously misused, as they are used by anyone who has knowledge and doesn't know the ends of life. Thank you, Dr. Adler. <laughs> now, our regular audience in Town Hall, New York, has held its meeting this evening just as if the broadcast were originating there, where it usually does and is eagerly waiting to ask some questions of our speakers. The meeting in New York is being conducted by Dr. Bester, chairman of our board of trustees. And I'm going to ask Dr. Bester to call for questions from our New York audience in the usual fashion, and they will be answered by our speakers here in Cleveland. All right, Dr. Bester in Town Hall, New York. Our first question right here. This is a double barrel question to Dr. Studebaker. Am I correct in understanding you to say that you do not think the teacher should be free to express his own opinions and convictions in the classroom. If not, who is to decide what opinions and convictions he should express in the classroom? So I have a question is this. Should uh, not teachers be free to express their own personal opinions in the classroom? My answer, briefly, is that teachers will be given almost unlimited freedom to express their personal opinions in the classrooms if first they have convinced their students and the public that they are not seeking to impose upon their learners their own personal choices. If they're really objective and impartial and fair and intellectually honest themselves and are exposing their learners to opinions other than their own, then when they come to expressing their own personal choices, their individual choices have a weight only equal to those choices of other persons who do not agree with them. 
I think that's the way for teachers to have the kind of academic freedom that, personally, most of us want. Thank you, sir. I'd like to put this question to Mr. Denny or any one of the speakers whom he designates. A definition of education was given earlier in the program as a development of the individual's personality to fit the world about us. Now, the question is this. Doesn't this definition involve a vicious circle? Inasmuch as it is the personalities, taken collectively, of each individual person which compose the world about us, then how can the, in that, then how can the personality be fitted to the world which the sum of the personalities has made? Comment on that? Maybe you don't agree with the definition. There are two parts of the question. One aspect of it is what human nature is. Supposing, as I should suppose, that human nature is the same in all of us. Education has a determinate constant in that fact, and all men are to be made as human as possible. I don't think either the natural world or, as a matter of fact, the whole social world is created by man's individual personal differences. Therefore, a man can be well-trained if he is made human by the development of his natural human powers to adjust to the natural and social world about him. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gulick. Uh, today's students in many high schools throughout the country are joining organizations such as the American Student Union in order to do their bit for democracy and for an educational program such as yours. But in many cases, in fact, most cases, they're not allowed to meet in schools. Do you think that is just or democracy in education? I also know of many schools in which the educational authorities have put no block in the way of the formation of student union branches or any other student groups. It seems to me that the question of student organization and the nature of the programs must be made to depend upon the program of the local school. Thank you, sir. We have a telegram here from three University of Chicago law students addressed to Dr. Adler. What role should the church assume in modern education? Dr. Adler, the problem of church and school in a democratic society, which is secularized, is not simply solved. You have the problem of religious education, I think, and it's a problem that we have not yet faced properly in this country. I think President Roosevelt was saying something profoundly true when he implied or said explicitly in his last address to Congress that the democratic institutions cannot be indifferent to religion. If that is true, our educational system cannot be indifferent to religion. But how we shall solve this problem, I don't know. Woman in the gallery there. Democracy increase whether a general department of education with adequate funds while the army and navy departments will combine into a department of defense. Would it uh, assist matters if uh, you had a federal department of education and then if you combined the army and navy into a department of defense? Uh, Dr. Studebaker, that sounds like your question. What is it? Uh, would it help matters if there were a federal department of education and why not uh, combine the Army and Navy Department? I don't see what the two have to do with each other, but go ahead and comment on the first one. <laughs> well, I don't want to engage in such a big war, so I'll just stick to education. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it would be advisable to have a Department of Education in the sense in which the word department is used in the government. Department down there means that a cabinet member heads the function directly. That would mean that we would have a cabinet member directly responsible for federal participation in education. The longer I live, the uh, more I believe that we should find unique ways in which to organize education as a part of the structure of the federal, state, and local governments so that those administrative units for the management of public education are as far as possible removed from party politics. Dr. Studebaker, do you think recent textbooks on economics which condemn American advertising and teach students to distrust American manufacturers are proper for use in public schools and state colleges? 
Can you repeat that question, Dr. Vester? Yes, this is a question, uh, Mr. Dunny, for Dr. Studebaker, as to whether this uh, books on economics, which condemn American advertising and teach students to distrust American manufacturers, are proper subjects for public schools. Dr. Studebaker, books, sir. The textbooks that teach uh, distrust of American manufacturers are proper textbooks for schools. You know of any school books like that? Oh, that raises the old question as to what we mean by the word teach. Now, perhaps the questioner means that uh, by the word teach, propagandize, impose. I think we ought to mean by the word teach, uh, guiding a, a free learning process. Therefore, I should say, if there is such a book, and I imagine uh, there is, uh, all such books might well be brought into the classroom and then go, do a good job of teaching by letting the young people figure out uh, which book or which parts of the books uh, they think are most honestly handled. That's teach, in my opinion. I want to tell you, it gives one a most peculiar feeling to be moderator of a meeting which is going on in two places at the same time, several hundred miles apart. But of course, there are hundreds of meetings going on in connection with this program tonight. And this is just the beginning of the discussion period for them. Before I close, I want to take this opportunity to thank the American Association of School Administrators for their hospitality and cooperation, the officials of the National Broadcasting Company of Cleveland, and to extend to you all a cordial invitation to come to New York and visit us and participate in one of our home programs in Town Hall. And now, Mr. Burnett, how about our program for next week? Next week at this hour, America's Town Meeting of the Air, back at its home in Town Hall, New York, will consider the question... Would a union of democracy save world peace? The speakers, Clarence K. Stride, Geneva correspondent of the New York Times, a close observer of the League of Nations for the past nine years, Dorothy Detzer, executive secretary of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, former social worker at Hull House, Chicago, and relief worker with the American Friends Service Commission. Georgie Sikorsky, editor and publicist who has a long background of experience in Russia and the Far East. The program will be based essentially on the widely discussed proposal contained in Mr. Strite's new book, Union Now, which calls for the immediate union of 15 North Atlantic democracies. On the following week, March 16th, we will discuss the subject, What Should Be Our National Defense Policy? And the speakers will be Senator H. Stiles Bridges, Republican of New Hampshire, and Senator Tom Connolly, Democrat of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Now will you tell us how to obtain copies of tonight's discussion? Every week, the full program, America's Town Meeting of the Air, including all speeches, questions, and answers, is published by Columbia University Press in a magazine called Town Meeting. Copies are 10 cents each, a nominal charge to cover printing and handling, while subscriptions to the entire series of 26 issues, including the back numbers so far this year, cost $2 and a half. They may be obtained by sending your order to Town Hall... 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. This is the National Broadcasting Company.